I've observed, and maybe it's because we're now have a physical location, but what's exciting is um, I'm seeing more people who've never been exposed to any of this work, um, coming from environments where they may not even have a garden because um, they don't have access to that, or they've chosen to live in an environment where there's not a lot of places to garden, um, coming to these events and wanting to do this dye work and or just learn more about textile and I think that that urban community learning and being exposed to this um, has a lot of meaning. Um, it helps, helps them understand the provenance of where things come from, the terroir of it, and I think we just need more of that in the world um, so that people can even just be like more thoughtful, dare I say consumers, but you know we all are and we could do a better job of thinking through our decisions when we are exposed to source. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about more people who are seeing this work, they're like, oh, and they're thinking about their clothes, you know, and what are my clothes made of or what are these colors made of? It's bringing forward those kinds of questions. Mm. I'm seeing more of that than I have in the past. A lot of people will come to our work in the past and have already have a practice. So we're seeing people without a practice now coming in greater numbers. That must be very satisfying for you to know your influence there. I think, yes, yeah. Oh, better than continually trying. I mean, yeah, I don't think this work can grow. <laughs> you know, for the farmers to have more support because what they're doing is a lot of hard work and it's not easy to pay all the bills on a farm so the more people who understand what that really looks like and can support it the happier I am because the more farms and bucolic pastures we have and the more like to me it's about land you know keeping land healthy um, and beautiful and not just a freeway and a mini mall mm. <laughs> and a suburb which we've got just in my mind like way way too much of compared to how I mean people don't we're taking the soul out of the land in my opinion in those circumstances and people like yearn to reconnect with something that's a little more open and a big garden like it's like, oh this is great yeah we don't have to develop our land like that but the way we consume it drives that we're all implicated in this <laughs> So we're so used to outsourcing, aren't we? Getting everything done elsewhere, out of sight and out of mind. That's right. Mm. So um, I notice, I mean, it's great that you've got a physical presence now, isn't it, here? Yeah, it's been 10 years. We've been virtual um, and not, yeah, not very able to host people we've hosted people on other people's farms and ranches and that's been really great but it is nice it's easier to have more events when it's your own space yeah so how do you think being getting closer to the origins of our clothing is useful for social and emotional well-being i think um i think there's a couple of levels um, I could answer that on, but one is just a sense of meaning when you can identify who was involved in the making of your clothing, whether it was you or people in your community. There's um, there's a, a world, a, you know, a story of the world that starts to shape, a story of your world that starts to shape as a human being. And that is important because if without stories that we care about, <laughs> you know, we, we lose a certain layer of, I would say, um, depth. <laughs> and so, yeah, this ability to understand, oh, this is the plant material the clothing's made out of. That's how it's grown. Even if they just know the simplest things, even if they don't know where exactly it was grown, that's a big starting point. Um, I think there's also an energy in our clothing um, and our lives. It's like this hard to quantify and easier to qualify maybe, but it's a feeling that you have around the vibration of certain things. Um, and I think things that are made with um, a lot of care <laughs> and attention, that translates. Um, and you just feel better in, in those garments. You feel 
just more at home, I think, more grounded, more part of your community, more part of this planet. I think the planet needs, yes, more attentive humans, more humans who are asking questions about the source, who was involved, how much time it took for they themselves to get involved in the process so they know how to respect it. It's hard to respect something that you're not fully aware of how it was done. So I think the work of like getting your hands involved, um, knowing what it is to have to grow a plant, how much care plants need, how much attention they need. When you start to respect it, you're willing to, I think, invest more in something that has a story, that has a, a transparency back to source. And the more we can create that connectivity, the less abuse that there tends to be. Because you can't, you can abuse in the textile system or the food system easily. It's so easy. It's so easy to abuse plants. It's easy to abuse animals. It's easy to abuse land. That's our most of our system right now. It's it's far more extractive than it is putting. It does not put in more than it takes every year. <laughs> it keeps putting us into ecological debt. So the more we can be like, oh, that's what it actually takes to do it right, we wake up and we start to say, oh, you know, I actually don't need that many items of clothing. I could invest in this artist's piece or invest in the yarn and learn how to do it myself. And it seems like this thing that a lot of people off the cuff think is like it lacks modernity or it's not the new shiny thing, but it's, it's truly what the global north needs to be doing like we are so we're consuming 35 million metric tons of earth's biomass per year per capita so like each human being in the global north in the u.s in particular compared to in the global south per capita it's two million metric tons i shouldn't say that take away the million Globally, we're consuming 92 billion metric tons of Earth's biomass per year, and the sustainable level is 58 billion tons. Excuse me. 35 metric tons of biomass, not million, is per capita per year in the global north, particularly the U.S. Two metric tons is the annual consumption rate per capita per year of global south. 35 and two. Mm -hmm but we're at 92 globally. So every year we go into ecological debt in July. We, we consume a year's worth of the Earth's photosynthetic material. And not just that, we, you know, my, the mines and the systems that take way longer to replenish with those sphere-based carbon, precious minerals and metals. We're in ecological debt six months into the year. We've already consumed the next year's resources. Mm. So this all is the work of the planetary boundary work by Johan Rockström and others. It's very mathematically clear that the that we in the US, Canada, um, Australia is technically in the southern hemisphere, but plays a very consumptive role as well uh, because it's a colonial landscape and it's got that European <laughs> set of entitlements um, like we all do in the US and Canada and Western Europe. So it's our obligation to the rest of the world to slow it down. And uh, like you're doing great work at Fibershed, but what can other groups or governments or councils do to um, move things along a bit in terms of awareness and behaviour change? Well, they could stop fast tracking permits for retail shops and, you know, and malls and freeways and suburbs, and they could start really putting tax incentives into value added processing. like commercial localized commercial kitchens where we can make preserve our own foods more locally that should not be a hard thing to permit it's really hard to permit you know washing wool in our communities really hard to get done but you can import all these plastic clothes from wherever have them shed into the marine ecosystem while you have wool growers in your own community who can't even wash their material it's not even like technically legal to do it in most counties because of the way the permits work. So what could government do? It could get itself some priorities. What are our priorities? Are our priorities soil to soil circular economies? Okay, yes, that sounds good. Well, what does that mean? It means you have to incentivize really good land stewardship in the regions you live 
You have to incentivize the value addition. You need tax credits. You need streamlined permitting processes. You need public funding to match private funding. You need patient capital. And you need the entire thing to be able to then, once a finished product is made, be utilized. And then you need cultural practices supported in schools, universities, and colleges to keep those clothes in some kind of sense of like use. How, what's the craft of use? And how do you build that into the education system? And then you need composting to be streamlined and, and permitted and legal. There's a lot of places where you can't even compost. So the, the carbon cycle's broken and the policies keep it that way. And they keep us importing things. It's easier to import it from another land than it is to do it yourself. And that's not even a question or a statement I'm putting on the individual. That's a statement I'm putting to governments. They don't make it easy for us to do what we need to do to regionalize our economies. They do not have the right carrots and sticks out there to make this work right now. And then it will sit down under there for a while because we're looking for some depth here. Mm -hmm. But, but I can just, because I can keep it going. Oh. <laughs> 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 just, just to pull it out real quick, just to see what you get from such a quick, I mean, I was only in there for less than 15 seconds. It started with me looking for a natural color to put color on a brand new set of t-shirts that I was exploring for a business line. So I imported some very special cotton from Egypt, from the only certified biodynamic cotton grower in the world. The only one, Egypt. And it was a beautiful uh, story, their initiative, Sakem's story is great. So I brought over this biodynamic cotton and I thought, I'm gonna start a whole new market for biodynamic cotton and I'm gonna convert some bi uh, cotton growers here in the United States, maybe even California, to be biodynamic. And I knew that if I was going to do that, it would probably be an organic a cotton grower that would be the first one to maybe think that they'd want to do that. And so it was from there that I got hooked up with Vibershed, and then Rebecca introduced me to Sally Fox, and I learned about her, and she was open to biodynamics. And so I go, brilliant, this is like a, I'm being led. But one thing led to another, so I learned about the indigo and so trying to get the color. In the meantime, I could tell that my path was not going to be trying to convert farmers to biodynamic. It wasn't going to happen. It would be uh, a, ch a challenge. It would be, you know, it wouldn't be fun and, and, and I, for many reasons. So that was kind of a long story on where I came to the indigo, but still I had my product and I still wanted to put co a color on there. So as we speak now, I'm not going to be doing that line anymore. I've just gone all in on the indigo and I love the journey. And that's where it started. And then eight years later, you know, I'm getting the indigo seedlings out to a lot of folks, gathering up, getting more quantity of the indigo and being able to do some more scale work, hopefully. And um, it's kind of where it started and where I'm at now. And why, why are you attracted to the natural dye and the indigo? The, um, you know, it just came about that that was the color that came first. And sure enough, I like blue. They say, oh, you know, your blue eyes and blue. Although I pick and choose when I wear blue. It's not always my favorite to wear. So I'm kind of going around about there. But I think I liked it because I was the only, you know, because it's so hard and it's so unique and it's so mysterious. And so I love chasing those kind of things. And so um, I would say that was part of the reason, just going, well, no one else is doing it. And I had my hands on it already. And because of the, the special floor that Vibershed has to do the composting, no one was going to take on that that I saw. And so I took it on as that that fun goal of being the only one, kind of, you know, in, in this region. I love I loved anything that's a learning curve in the arts. And so um, that kind of speaks to my attraction to it. There's um, another element about it that I wonder what it is about this plant. Is it this ego thing, like maybe what I just described about being the only one? And so I don't know that, and I think I need to think about that a little bit more. But uh, even Rebecca had mentioned, so I'm borrowing this, but another writer of Poland, or whatever his name is, saying, I wonder if the plant's cultivating you, or who's cultivating who? You know, so I think that's a playful thought. Uh, but to get deeper, to find out what, what the answer is on that, 
I thought I would seek out a little counseling, you know, from uh, uh, this one lady I found that's like a plant spirit person and helps you through some life journeys, but I haven't hit her up yet. <laughs> but it's a thought, because I joke saying, hey, I need some counseling on this, or at least I need some clarity on what is it that you're trying to do. And what uh, it's about the clothing too, isn't it? Like about the connection to what you're wearing and having something unique and individual? I'd say yes, for sure. And that, that speaks to that very beginning drive about wanting to make a difference within the cotton, cotton world, but also my interest in biodynamic agriculture. But that speaks to quality and taking care of the land. And so I thought it would be a no-brainer about that. So it is the processes that that, that matters to me. Mm. And so to be so involved with it now, even though I'm going to, quote, abandon, not abandon, I'm still very interested in cotton cultivation, but uh, but to be around it where now I can dye their, their products and I don't have to be this designer because I just, I could see that just wasn't going to be me. So uh, I still get all, the, I get all the goodies. I get the fulfillment, I get the relationships, and uh, I feel very good shy of what I've just said about wondering about things in general, I'll figure it out. You know, I feel blessed to be able to take the journey. So. Yes, um, so is it an economic proposition or are you in investing um, for, for fun, you know? At first, I thought it was business and, and I've taken a lot of the business things that Fibershed has offered and I still do because I want the spreadsheet. I want to know what the true value is. I want to know what I can tell a farmer about what I can pay him so I can harvest it. So there's a business, but there's a part of me that wants to release that and free myself up without that anxiety of trying to make a profit because it would be very expensive. It's small, it's still R&D, and um, I just don't want that pressure. And so I want to release that and say this is a hobby. I'm lucky enough that I have my pension. You know, and our budget, our family budget's just fine. So release yourself, become the artist, and feel good about the goodies that come with it. And that is being part of the story. And that at some point, you know, uh, having that blue available on a bigger scale would make more of a difference. We're really, it's very minor. But it's not minor. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to say it's that minor because uh, the awareness is something in itself. Are you finding awareness is growing and interest is growing in what you're doing? One more time. Are you finding interest is growing in what you're doing? For sure, for sure, for sure. I think there was already already a little wave, even at the very beginning. But I, I kind of had a little sense of it. You know, even though I was new to it, I could see where where the pulse was going. And every year since then, it just kind of compounded. I'll say. I like to think I, you know, contributed to that because I'm getting seeds out to folks. I'm getting seedlings out to people. I'm now dying. I gave a clap, you know, so uh, whether that made some big impact on the awareness, maybe locally, you know, in a little way, but I see that as a group and you're seeing that within, you know, passion brands and wanting sustainability and the transparency. And, you know, this is a difficult one for even a brand to even introduce even in a vintage or a small thing because it has its complications and I can understand why they don't do it. But um, that doesn't mean it can't be done on a smaller scale. And so I do think that popularity, you know, and Pantone just had blue just two years ago that was very close to the, neg the, the indigo blue, close. So the, I don't even think there was a big ripple on that, but the, the, it was there. <laughs> what do you think's driving the interest? Driving, driving the interest? it, yeah. yeah. I think it is that um, evolving uh, consumer awareness. Um, but it's still a small market. That's still small because of the costs and the, the few providers of choices, you know, like designers and such. But I think uh, I'm seeing the youth care uh, from some youth brands wanting sustainability and, and promoting it and such. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, there's some nice documentaries out that probably made some impact on some people, showing the fashion industry, including the, you know, uh, the dying portion of it. So from documentaries and just, a, just an increased awareness, general.